Okay, we're back here live in New York City. This is SiliconAngle.com and Wikibon.org's coverage, exclusive coverage of HP Moonshot, where the game is changing at the server, data center, cloud mobile, and social, an inflection point where the transformation to a new modern era is occurring, and HP is leading the charge. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante at Wikibon.org, and we're here with Lakshmi Mandiam, who's with ARM. She's the director of server and systems ecosystems, and. Uh, Mark Andreessen, I think, said uh, software is eating the world. Open source software is eating the software world, and ARM is eating everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking a hot company, created an un unreal innovation, and uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you for having us. Yeah, so um, we were here at uh, 2011, the original Moonshot announcement, mm -hmm. and um, you guys kind of got this whole thing started with, right. with HP. So. Uh, a lot has happened since then. Um, yeah. Give us an update on, on ARM and we'll get into some, some of what you're doing. It's actually been a really exciting period from the server program perspective. I mean, think about um, you know fourth quarter 2011. It wasn't that long ago, mm. even though we feel like it was long. It was only about 14 months. And we've seen this, this um, groundswell in terms of ARM and servers. So it was exciting for me personally today watching three of our partners talking about server cartridges for the Moonshot program. I think originally Calzada was the one that was announced, but we've yep. had um, TI, Applied Micro, and, um, and Calzada. And I think the beauty of it was that each of them brings their own special sauce uh, to the equation. And I think that's what this whole launch to me has been about in terms of people thinking about the server and the data center paradigm completely differently. Uh, and how can innovation occur on, on, I think you talked about workload specific optimizations, heterogeneous processing, all of the elements that ARM and partners are used to doing in other spheres of operation are now coming to the server. Yeah, I think that's great. Our colleague David Floyer, of course he's from England, he calls it horses for courses. That's right, and, um, I've heard that a lot at work. And, and so we see, is this the end of uh, the one size fits all kind of vanilla server world? From the I, I think it's certainly a step in that direction. I mean, if you think about um, the, the real world challenges that people are facing, you know, they cannot afford to waste even a single watt um, in terms of trying to sustain generic general purpose processing. Uh, and I think the benefit of the ARM architecture is you kind of get the benefits of standardization uh, and being able to work to run generic workloads, but you also get the, the, the benefit of heterogeneous processing and specialization, for example, um, you know, Applied Micro talking about their networking and connectivity background, TI talking about their um, you know, DSP and signal processing background, and of course, Calzada talking about integration of storage fabric and, and, and Ethernet switching and all these kinds of things. And there are other partners that are part of the uh, Pathfinder um, ecosystem uh, that were mentioned, like, you know, Marvell, for example, has expertise in storage. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of different partners that have expertise in these various domains. And now as we're seeing this application convergence happening, they're able to bring those that expertise to bear uh, and take advantage of standard ARM server platforms with that special sauce. For them. And I think that's what's going to make the world of difference. So um, when you see, oftentimes when you see a new market emerging, it's mm -hmm. highly integrated. Mm -hmm. This one seems to be starting off disintegrated. <laughs> yeah. Know? Very, very specialized. Now, now perhaps you know in mobile it started out mm -hmm. you know fairly integrated. So this is is this a natural outgrowth of, of that trend? Um, and 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 can the market support that much disintegration? Well, I think that um, you know where there is a need. Um, I think you know, and I don't think of ARM as only playing in the specialized mm -hmm. parts of, the, of that equation. I just think the new normal is going to be more integration, and so I think ARM is just uh, very well positioned in terms of, of the uh, partnerships that we have, um, the, s the processor technology that we're bringing to bear. And it's not just about processor; it's also about process technology as well. So you know, we have multiple fab partners that are talking about. 16 nanometer and below FinFET designs. And so I think it's the entire ecosystem of innovation that's coming to play. And I mean, we, we talked today, I mean, there are other partners that have announced 16 core ARM-based designs that are going into networking and other applications. And so I think you'll just, you'll start to see more and more deployment of the ARM architecture pervasively in enterprise spaces, not just the servers. Yeah, so when did this all, take us back to sort of 
sort of the inside baseball of you know, many, many years ago when mm -hmm. I said, all right, we're, we're really doing well in uh, you know, the smartphone space, and, and, but we see a much broader application for this. Was that yeah. day one, you know, or um, has it sort of evolved from you know, customer demand? Or? It, it's kind of interesting. It's a bit of a combination of both. You know, so we've, we've uh, I think, you, really this, the server activity probably started about four to five years ago, and we actually had an OEM that called us and said, you know what, I'm running out of power, I'm running out of space, I want to really look at um, using your technology because, you know, obviously being battery powered, um, I was just telling someone earlier today, I took my, my Windows RT based device um, to China and I couldn't charge it every day, yeah. but it wasn't catastrophic because, yeah. you know, it's an ARM based server and so mobile and and, and having that power envelope Always really helps. In. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> or else. <laughs> <laughs> but but essentially, you know, having yeah. the having the battery operated, you know, philosophy in terms of d your design yeah. just naturally leads to more energy efficiency. But also in terms of having to navigate down the cost curve and have more and more integration, mm -hmm. you know, that helps as well. And so so really, I think. You know, I, I think Dave talked about it this morning about how the ecosystem is now being driven by uh, mobile and, and tablets. Um, and so, you know, we've had uh, people that have called us and said, you know, how do we take advantage of the power efficiency, the integration, and the cost curve? Um, and I think just the intellectual capital in terms of people investing in the ARM architecture from, you know, your software engineers that are developing on the ARM architecture. I mean, we had 8.7 billion chips shipped last year. Yeah, it's just a, just, it's the numbers are astounding. It right? is it's, astounding. It's a volume game and, and also it gives you advanced visibility into the, the software innovations that are exactly. going on. So can you talk about the software activities that are going yeah. on in the ecosystem? Absolutely. So if we, if we think about um, where you know, we, we have gotten traction just specifically from the server space, mm -hmm. it's really yeah. been around open source. Um, and and uh, I think back in um, I want to say it was 2011. Um, we had partners, um, and uh, you know, running Ubuntu announced a, a, you know, Canonical announced a commercial deployment of, of Ubuntu and long-term support for Ubuntu, and so has Red Hat has, has also demonstrated. And so um, what what we're seeing is that that kind of open system innovation uh, has been occurring. And ARM actually invested in a not-for-profit company called Lenaro. Uh, which is focused on uh, Linux innovation. And, and this is a great example of our business model because it's ARM and partners collaborating together, sharing engineering resources um, to drive innovation. And so last fall, we announced the Lenaro Enterprise Group, and this was focused on server uh, software. And, and HP is a, is a member of that. And so um, you know we had 14 companies that were part of that, HP, um, Facebook and others. And so you can see this kind of collaboration trying to accelerate time to market. And I think uh, Dave talked about how now with this new pa Pathfinder ecosystem that they have, they expect to be able to get things three times faster than they could historically. And this is again an example of where they're not reliant on historical cadences or limitations in terms of the ecosystem uh, to be able to drive innovation. Yeah. So. Um HP, obviously, leader here mm -hmm. uh, out in front, but uh, presumably you're getting inquiries from other <laughs> large OEMs. Uh, there, there's definitely a, a number of servers that have been uh, announced based on the ARM architecture. Um, there's been a commercial rollout uh, of a storage server based on the ARM architecture. Right. Um, so there's there's quite a bit of activity that's, that's ongoing. And I think, you know, we've had our partners um, Calzada and TI and others that have systems out there now, and of course Applied Micro is also uh, bringing out their 64-bit system. And I think you'll start to see more and more partners um, come out uh, in terms of their solutions based on 64-bit architecture. And we, I think you'll see. We had Ian Ferguson on uh, our last yes. June and Moonshot, just to yes. some of the uh, video here. But uh, you know, what's happened? Take us through from that time, 14 months ago to today, uh -huh. and also talk about the software market that's changed. Obviously, we're talking about software-defined data center. Right. The servers are a big part of that. That's programmability, right. some of the efficiencies in mm -hmm. management, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. What's happening now? Where's the demand uh, that you see 
in the marketplace uh, that's, that's good, that you guys are addressing. Can you, can you talk about some of those key changes that's happened since 14 months ago and kind of where is it going the next couple of years? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I talked about having uh, Oracle, for, for example, announcing Java support for 32-bit ARM processors, and last year they mentioned um, at TechCon, which is our show, uh, that they would support 64-bit. And so uh, you're starting to see workloads like Hadoop and other things that are dependent on open source and, and Java, for example, mm -hmm. uh, being run now on the ARM architecture. Um, and so we're starting to see a number of different workloads. I think earlier today several people talked about um, tuning their workloads specifically and even looking at, you know, looking at uh, how they can optimize their workloads. So we see that pervasively in storage servers. Um, data analytics, content delivery networks, all of these different areas. And the, big, and the main driver is energy? Is Well, actually, it's not just energy. It's really around total cost of ownership. So when I say that, OPEX is one aspect of it, which is the mm -hmm. energy, but it's also around performance density. I think today they talked about um, you know how they want to achieve greater and greater performance mm -hmm. density. So it's really about saving floor space, saving facilities, power and cooling, uh, saving cost of acquisition in terms of reducing the number of components, um, increased reliability because you're you're not now dependent on one server node. So I think it's all yeah, of those. Yeah, we have elements. people on Twitter basically saying that's all great, but that's not software defined servers. Right. What is what is software defined servers? I think people are defining what software defined servers are. It's not are. defined yet, so yeah. it's software led. That's what we always say. So it's not yeah. yet defined. And, <laughs> and I think the beauty of software defined is at the, at the end of the day, the end user is going to drive what is software defined, right? And that's driven by the apps. Yeah, it's driven the by the apps. applications. It's driven by the kind of workloads. Um, so it, well, it's you know, when I come back to the hyperscale space, mm -hmm. and, and to me, those guys are software defined because yeah. they just want to commoditize the exactly. infrastructure and they want to automate everything, exactly. no humans. I, I, I would consider that software defined mm -hmm. and, and I would consider the traditional enterprises anything, anything mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. and so now there's aspects of that that they want to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a portion of the enterprise, you know, will. Right. Uh, but it's going to take some time. And then, of course, the other thing is they're going to have to rely on either suppliers like HP mm -hmm. or Oracle or whomever, software companies to deliver that, or they're going to go to the cloud. Right. So talk about how you see those two, or do you see those two worlds, that hyperscale world and the traditional enterprise coming together? Are, 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 are they going to blend? Are they going to stay quite distinct for some time? I think it depends. Um, so you I should be an analyst, by the way. Right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but it does depend, right? Are you hiring? Okay. No, yeah, yeah, we are, actually. Um, so, uh, <laughs> We're looking for a software. Uh, we need more time. <laughs> <in this interview. laughs> um, so, so I actually think that you know, long term, people can't ignore this trend, right? You look at um, there's a, been a bunch of reports that talk about how most of the workloads in the future are going to be cloud resident, and if you think about cost of you know for a small medium business, you know, is it going to be cheaper for them to deploy on the cloud or deploy on their own enterprise? So I think enterprises will have to start looking at how, because I'm sure CIOs are going to say, why can't I go and deploy on cloud service X? Mm. You know, what benefit are you bringing for me? And so I think enterprises will have to respond to either rethink the way they're doing business as an enterprise, or um, think about options where maybe some workloads go to the cloud, some stay in-house. So I think there's going to be a, a shift in the way people are thinking about how to solve these challenges. And the innovation, this is what I love so much about ARM, is because the innovation's all coming from consumer, it's mm -hmm. coming from the, the web scale giants, and they're, they're harbingers, they're showing the traditional data center. It's not only the CIOs, I'd, I'd, point out, I'd say it's the CEO exactly. who's saying, why? Oh, my Facebook at home is so easy. My Gmail is so easy. Exactly. Why is it my enterprise IT? Of I mean, it's, we it's, understand why. Yeah, but they I, it's like the user experience. You, you hit the nail on the head, right? So I'm used to using my tablet, my mobile device. I'm able to drag and drop things and make things easier. So in the end of the day, um, it's I want that experience everywhere, and that experience today is on ARM. Right. And I, th I think that's why it makes it easier for people to, to think about, you know, um, uh, duplicating that in other So areas. do you think we'll see that experience in the, in, the, in the traditional data center over the next, say, decade? You know, maybe it'll I take longer. So. Yeah, I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, I mean, the complexity in the back end is still very high, but right. from a user standpoint, yeah, yeah, I mean, you guys are at the heart of that. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, again, this, this fundamental shift of always on, always connected, 
Um, today, we've all been on Twitter all day, right? I mean, it's, that's just the way life is now, and I think people are starting to look at economies of scale in terms of making that experience better for well, and people. And utilization, too, that's come up, too. Obviously, yeah. having the ability to have low yes. power, high performance, variable-based workload management. It's yeah, really orchestration is key. It's key, and I think, you know, this big debate about, you know, again, the many, I think Carl Freund talked about it earlier, mm -hmm. you know, having many nodes that deliver. It's, it's really about performance per watt for the end user. Yeah. It's not about anything else. Yeah, it's going to be funny. I think, you know, Donatelli's right. We're going to look back at this time and say, hey, you know, remember when we were talking? Remember when we had those chips and all that uh, power in it? Yeah. I think telematics, so all that, all this technology right. at the edge of the network right. is producing data. It's connected. It's amazing. And yeah. this is a, an obvious path. Yeah, and, and, and other markets are doing it. For example, base stations, which used to have many, many complex processors are now going to a base station on the chip. We've had server on a chip from some of the ARM partners that talk today. So I, th I think that's just, it is SOC, and how do you innovate uh, in the SOC to deliver the best performance per watt or best performance per dollar, whatever your metric is. And I think ARM, because of the breadth that we have, can can compete on any of those vectors. Yeah, and the, and the metrics are changing. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about competition a little bit, because um, you guys are obviously very disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we've seen, John, John and I are a little older, and we've seen all kinds of <laughs> disruptions over the years. But, but the, the guys who got disrupted in the, you know, the 80s and 90s were, were kind of dumb and arrogant. Um, and the guys that are being disrupted now aren't. And they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of resources. So talk about the competitive dynamic um, that, that you're seeing today, and how does ARM you know, stay ahead? How does it compete with the big whales? You know, we, at ARM, we have a really, um, our, our whole business model, and I think this is what is really well aligned to what HB was announcing today, it's really about partnership and ecosystem. And so when you think about ARM, it's not ARM, it's ARM and partners, which actually we have a thousand connected community partners, so it's mm -hmm. ARM and partners. Um, and so I think the other aspect of it is because of the way the IP is developed and the way we have a very long-term view. So things that I'm working on, I'm really looking at 2015, 2016. I'm talking to people about their plans for 2015, 2016. So you really have a long-term view in terms of where people are going and you can predict uh, trends and, and innovation. And I think we view our success as our partner's success as well. So it's not just a single entity arm, it's arm and partners. So if you think about where people can optimize, so people like um, Calzada, for example, are optimizing on performance with a balanced I.O. And, and Applied Micro has said, hey, we're going to go after the super high end. So if you think about... They're specializing in, yeah. the, in their use cases that they can really right. get exactly. a position in. And, and, and so we scale. I mean, we scale from microcontrollers that are in your, you know, light switch at home to, to you know, processors that are going into servers and base stations. So I think it's the scale and the ability to pick your optimization point. So it's not just a single entity, it's many working together and collaborating. And yeah. I think that's what the difference is. Yeah, and you guys are in it for the for the long run. Yes. I would say, I, would say, I mean, you're pretty much at these levels, uh, I would say pretty much acquisition proof. Not that there's been a lot of speculation there, but uh, you know, one never knows. But but no, seriously, I mean, you, you're trying to be a, a one of the next big whales, Absolutely. right? I mean, so Absolutely. with I a mean, little bit more speed, I presume. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, th I think, you know. Less power. <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah. less power. Um, a, a fast <laughs> swimming whale. Yeah. Maybe Doesn't like sweat. a sleek eel. How right, about right. that? How about we go with a sleek eel or something like that? No, but, but jokes apart, I think we're definitely um, focused on the long term. And if you think about it, you know, we're still shipping our ARM 7, which was in, invented in 1993 or something, still in pretty high volume. Right. So, you know, the reason that people look at ARM also is because they view us as being a long term strategic partner. Um, and I think that's fundamental to the way we operate. All right, good, exciting stuff, huge volumes, uh, big disruption. Uh, Lakshmi, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Yeah, thank you for having me, really uh, appreciate okay, it. Okay, we'll be right back with more great action here as we wind down and get all the action from HP Moonshot, uh, breaking it down. John Furrier with Dave Vellante here at SiliconANGLE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>